the Sponsored Research Coordinator here and the moderator for today's seminar. Uh, this is one of two seminars this week. We will be having the second seminar this Friday, May 4th, also at noon. Uh, we, that will be presented by uh, Dr. Sveta Kahl of the Indian uh, Institute of Petroleum, and that will be on potential of non-edible oils for energy and non-energy applications. Today's speaker we want to welcome, who's visiting us from Bangor, India, it's Dr. Satish Kalas. Uh, Dr. Kalas uh, received his PhD from the Divisional of Mechanical Sciences from the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore. He was a guest lecturer at the National Institute of Standards and Technology from 1996 to 1997. He then joined the Department of Mechanical Engineering, Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore as an assistant professor in 1997. He became a full professor in 2009. He currently is conducting research in the areas of tribology and metal forming. His specific areas of interest include biodegradable eco-friendly lubricants, friction stir welding, and friction in metal forming. He has authored more than 75 peer review uh, journal papers, 100 conference papers, four chapters in books, and several reports. He also uh, has a passion for designing and building equipment, and his group has designed and built a high-temperature vacuum-based pin-on disk machine, a high-temperature vacuum-based micro harvest tester, a high-temperature controlled environment fretting wear tester, and friction stir welding machines. So with that, I will turn the uh, presentation over to Dr. Pallas. Please give him a welcome. Thank you. So I am happy that I'm here and I thank uh, BK. BK was the key person to see that I come here. We met last year when I gave a talk in Peoria, USDA on a similar subject where uh, at that point of time, we were somewhere like 20% towards making this product. And today, I think we are made one set of the product, and I'll show you what we have done and our philosophy behind making this product. So I am uh, from the Department of Mechanical Engineering there, and Department of Mechanical Engineering started way back in 1945. Indian Institute of Science itself is a pretty old institution. So Indian Institute of Science is something that started in 1909. We are more than a century old. So it was started by a visionary from India, J.N. Tata, who also gave India the first steel plant and the first integrated power plant. And we are the largest number of science and engineering PhD students in the country about 2,200 in this campus with about uh, total student strength is around 3,000 there. So it's a very huge uh, research oriented campus, PhD campus I should say. And we have departments of all major sciences and engineering and today we have started many interdisciplinary programs, around 350 faculty members are there here and an annual budget is around 100 million dollars. Not big in terms of dollars but in terms of purchasing parity of the rupee, I think it's quite a huge budget. So before I go ahead, I first want to what do you call it, acknowledge the people who helped me in this work, uh, because sometimes you forget to acknowledge people in the hurry to finish the talk. So I first start off with that and so that you don't miss out anybody. So Professor Deepshika Chakravarti who is uh, working in the molecular biophysics, and so she helped us in the bacteriological studies for this thing. And Satvik, who is the person who really did, the, who is the backbone of this work. He is a senior research fellow in the lab, and uh, he was the one who really developed these products. So Uday Shankar Alam, Ramkrishna Mehta, and Jagdish Kumar Manekode, who are a part of the <coughs> institute, and they helped us in the biological and the tribological work. And the funding was given by Coconut Development Board in uh, Kerala. This is a uh, part of the uh, 
agricultural ministry there, they gave us this money to find out other uses of coconut oil. So that was their aim of the thing. And there are many references which I will not go into details in this talk. So we have about major eight references that I have referred to over in this talk. So when we started this work, we also looked into various issues of sustainability and what should be the philosophy that we take when we develop a product. Because we do believe in one thing and that is that science without philosophy and a philosophy without science are both meaningless. I tell my students that, tell them this is the first important thing you must learn in life. So you need to have a philosophy before you do research. Why you are doing it and what's the final aim and how you will go about it. So this being something that is to do with sustainability, first we need to understand and I need to teach the students what sustainability is and as simple term as possible without going through a huge course, you know, just the principles of that. So uh, it's basically because the limit to usage of materials, limit the rate of usage of materials, I'll explain what this is, and limit to the trash the world can handle. In a country like India, you throw away trash everywhere. Because trash, trash collection and uh, thing is not a very uh, well accepted there or it's, it's difficult to do because here may be the number of pop, amount of the population there itself. But in a country like United States or uh, the European country, you collect trash very well. But what do you do with the trash? You go and put it in landfills or you throw it into the sea. So uh, that itself is, is an answer to, you know, seemingly an answer to keep the place clean. But the thing is that this is going to hit you back sometime. It's, it's going to, the cycle has to close. So this is something that we have to understand that the amount of trash the world can handle is very, is, is, we are reaching the peak there and this is something that uh, we need to understand. So sustainability and eco-friendly are the key to the future. And what and why is eco-friendly? So some of the things here is that eco-friendly and biodegradable should not be confused. So something that is eco-friendly need not be biodegradable. Something that is biodegradable need not be eco-friendly. So many times people uh, think that if something is biodegradable, it is an eco-friendly product. It's not true. And uh, product can be eco-friendly, I was selling, and cannot be, need not be biodegradable. For example, you take ceramics, they are hardly biodegradable, but they are extremely highly eco-friendly because they just don't degrade itself. They are very stable compounds. And in, th in this world, you must realize everything is cyclic. So we start off with the simplest molecule as oxygen, that's a sense of life, and it becomes carbon dioxide <coughs> through a cyclic process where when you breathe out, you give carbon dioxide, and when you, this carbon dioxide is used by plants to breathe and create this thing. So, Basically, you have a cycle that's closed here. And this is the first thing I tell my students. That everything in this world is cyclic. These animals and plants are linked to each other. These I mean, this cycle is linked to other cycles. And finally, this, everything in this world is cyclic. There's nothing that is open-ended. So, and everything is interlinked. So you are interlinked in America to a person in India by some, some way. I don't know how it is, but there is a link that is there through various other links that come through it. The important thing about this link is that the cyclic uh, process is that the cyclic process time frames are not different. So you have time frame from as low as 10 raised to minus 15 seconds. Activities that cyclic and which is about 10 raised to minus 15 seconds. And uh, this, for example, is the pigment changing uh, rate in your uh, retina. So as you change your uh, color, your retina is able to immediately adjust to the, uh, the change in the color. And this apparently takes place at 10 raised to minus 15 seconds. Two cycles that last as much as 10 raised to 18 seconds. This is a, basically a theory of the big bang to big collapse. The time frame that is required for that is 10 raised to 18 seconds, about 100 billion years. That's what some theories say, but I don't know. I have just seen these numbers, I don't know whether the theories are correct or wrong and it's not a point to debate, but this is supposed to be the ultimate cycle that the world can go through, from the big bang to the big collapse. And finally everything, matter comes together and we have one more big bang, which takes 100 years. So 100 billion years, sorry. 
fortunately and uh, so it is it's the whole thing is cyclic the world is itself cyclic so in this vast darkness of the space that we see every night we have this beautiful planet and from this beautiful planet we take extract out materials and we refine these materials we alloy these materials i talk of alloying because this is basically a material science uh, related subject that i was teaching so alloying is a very key thing in uh, material science and then you manufacture using these alloyed materials you use them and you disp dispose them now this is has been the cycle that has been followed for most products today people talk of after use you refine it again alloy it again manufacture again use again or you talk of reconditioning and reusing or you can also talk of reconditioning manufacturing and reusing so there are different cycles that you can talk of which do not go into this this what you call uh, disposal cycle so you extract refine and then you need to do this close this loop now the question to be asked is when can i use this loop and when can i use this loop or when to need to go to this loop and when do i need to go to this loop so when do we recycle the most important thing is the time scale now if i go to the previous i think i'll use this if i go to this cycle you must remember from this extraction to disposal there is a time scale and that time scale is key to sustainability if you understand that i think you you understood that some processes are sustainable some processes are not sustainable for example using crude oil is an absolutely sustainable process provided you use crude oil at the rate at which it is produced by nature the problem is we are using crude at a much much faster rate than nature can produce it so time scale is exceptionally important so extraction disposal should be equal to the time of replenishment and that is if the cycle is open cycle that is you are going from extraction to the disposal route that's what you call an open cycle and the other one is what we can call a closed cycle so in the open cycle if you are having an extraction rate of extraction to rate of disposal uh, extraction disposal rate as much as nature can replenish then it's an absolutely sustainable cycle so if you are able for example use uranium as the rate at which nature can produce uranium and which is not producing nature doesn't produce uranium you can know that this nuclear cycle is a not close cycle so it's not a sustainable cycle maybe it will last for a few hundred years maybe a thousand years but after that you don't know what to do with that and so if this extraction disposal cycle is not in this particular time scale of uh, what you call replenishment you need to have the cycle closed now when you look at products this way it gives you a lot of important information that most of the products that we use today are not falling in this first category and is not falling in the second category that is we don't have this replenishment cycle as much as this and basically open or close that i talk about it is basically with respect to time scale like i told you beginning itself everything is cyclic so there is one philosophy say that you use what you want in this world doesn't matter finally it's all closed so you don't have to bother about use plastics use uh, gas use whatever you want don't bother about it so the question is now when you asking what time scale should i bother about it's a very philosophical question what time scale should you bother about use of materials shall i use crude at the rate at which we're using today and not bother about it now to me i would say that you need to close the cycle or you need to see the open or close cycle with respect to what you can see the farthest so you know for example that you are using crude at a rate much faster than what it can be replenished so obviously you must see that you don't do it and how do you go about doing that is a question that you need to answer and that's where i think human ingenuity should come so when when you see this particular philosophy you see that when you do, when you when you it calls for a complete change in the lifestyle a complete change from the present lifestyle that we are having 
And if we don't, I would say nature will make you do it someday or the other. May not be in your lifetime, may not be in your children's lifetime, maybe they'll escape it. Their children might escape it, but it'll catch up. But we can start today because all it takes is a complete change in the way we do designing today, the way we use materials. Okay? And this is also a challenge to manufacturing and material scientists. How do we use materials at the rate? That thing? So for example, we make steel. Can I make a product that can be completely recycled, 100% recycled? I can't say I'll make something 99% recycled. Because if one person adds, adds up, adds up, adds up, and then it's not a... It's a tough thing to reach this stage, but with the philosophy that is clear, then I think you'll, you'll, you'll reach that stage faster. So when you talk of cutting fluids, it's possibly one of the most uh, poisonous material that's used in the machining operations. Okay. So in this loop, where do cutting fluids, that's something that I'll be touching upon, but before that I'll just explain to you that cutting fluids are basically, is used to cool the tool and workpiece. It reduces the abrasion and adhesion between the tool and the material and the wear of the tool. It imparts good surface finish, washes away chips, prevents rusting and corrective to the whole machine. And traditional cutting fluids are made from mineral oils. Contains many of them contain sulfur, and almost all of them, or in fact every one of them, has chemically synthesized or modified emulsifiers and chemically synthesized additives which en enhance the cutting performance. And no cutting fluid is not a poison. Okay, why this is a problem? You can collect these cutting fluids and make it benign and then throw it away. But the biggest problem here is in many countries this simply does not happen. And it is even in the United States it cannot and will not happen 100%. So at some point you are you are uh, contaminating the place you are working. In India apparently many of the places after they use it they just dump it out somewhere wherever they want to. So in the cutting fluid cycle that is followed you have extraction of materials that is a mineral oil and whatever you extract, you refine and you manufacture all the additives, you mix it, you use it, you dispose it, and you throw it away. Sometimes you use it, you recondition it and then dispose it. But this cycle, because straight away you are using a material that is not replenishable, the cycle is not closed. Mineral oil itself is not replenishable. Many of the chemicals that are used in that are not replenishable, highly poisonous. So we need to look at cutting oils. Can we, for example, make an, a cycle like this that's completely closed? When I say closed, it's a time scale. So with that philosophy, we started this work. We wanted to build a non-biodegradable, I mean, this is, uh, this is coming to the cutting fluids that's there today. It's non-biodegradable, non-renewable, unsustainable, and highly toxic to the ecosystem. It basically affects aquatic system and groundwater source. Very, very large effects are there in many parts of the world. Health impacts associated with exposure include uh, irritation of skin, lungs, eyes, nose and throat. And uh, leading to more severe conditions such as what you call dermatitis, asthma, hypersensitivity, pneumonitis and then a variety of cancers that are produced by these cutting fluids because the chemicals used are highly toxic. And there are a large amount of toxins that are produced by uncontrolled growth of bacteria in these cutting fluid. And basically I'm talking of emulsions here. And highly objectionable odor. When you close down the machine shop for the weekend and come back, the amount of smell that is there in these uh, cut, these machine shops are uh, very difficult for many of the workers to manage. So, the world, you know, I tell my students, the world was very, very less frightening when it was black and white. So good old days, we used to print only in black and white and project in black and white. Because that was the cheapest thing to do and it's not as frightening as it is today. But now when you look at things in color, it, it's more scary. So these bacteria look a little more scary than what it was, let's say, 40 years back when things were black and white. And you see some of the other things that uh, bacteria that, are, that grow in these which create serious problems. So you have uh, things that can really finish you off if you're not careful about these things produces all these kind of crazy diseases in the skin. It also starts uh, skin lesions, ketosis, oil, all kind of things that many workers complain about day in and day out. 
It also produces cancers, including rectum cancer and pancreatic cancer, not to speak of throat cancer. These figures are not as frightening as some of them which I got because uh, you have the most frightening cancer pictures on the packets of cigarettes. You, know, you don't smoke. So I, I didn't want to do that here because I want, we can't say you stop using cutting oils. So uh, with this things in background in mind, we started off with, we created a flow chart on how we will make these cutting oils. The challenge to the students was Create a cutting oil that you can drink. Can you come up with the solution? Now, if you create a cutting oil that you can drink, it's possibly the best thing that you can do. So, when I make this challenge first, and we had a challenge of uh, making grease. We are not reached there yet in grease. The challenge in the grease making was to make a grease that you can use as peanut butter. So problem is going to be that your grease uh, usage will increase because you have people in the factory coming up and uh, using them as peanut butter which is not something that uh, desirable. So we, when we went about selection of emulsifiers and the additives, we use additives which are naturally available. Plant extracts. But remember all plant extracts need not be benign. Some of them are highly toxic. So we need to select them very carefully. So what we did was we did some aquatic toxicity test. This is OECD 2003 method, which is 203 method, which is used standard in the European I'm sure it's used in many other places. So use here zebra fish to analyze the toxicity of the material. So here what we do is take seven zebra fish with a known concentration of this emulsifier and observe them for 96 hours. So the mortality of fish was monitored for in an interval of 24 hours. The concentration of steps, steps, uh, would be the uh, test sample increased in a geometry series and the concentration at which kills 50 percent of the fish in 96 hours is considered to be the limit. You can go beyond that it is toxic. So less than 100 milligram per liter is highly toxic and greater than 1000 milligram per liter is considered as non-toxic. So this is a test that uh, we create where we have fish that is maintained in the lab. They have to be done in very standard conditions where you keep them in certain temperature for certain hours and then transfer them to a tank so 15 liters where these emulsions or whatever you want to test is put there. So this part of the lab is actually the most quietest place in the lab. You know, I tell when our visitors come to the lab, I tell them this is where our students go and sit when they want to have peace of mind. But and but unfortunately, this is the part of the lab where maximum number of death take place. So <laughs> some of these things are because some of many of these things are highly toxic. So fishes die quite fast. What you said, maximum number of deaths that take place yeah. because the fish die. You know, when you use toxic thing, not not the, yeah. the maximum number of killing that takes place there. So, uh, of course, they're small fish, and I'm sure I'm not uh, violating any of the uh, animal rights or things like that. So, um, we tested various numbers of emulsions, and why I'm using emulsion 1, emulsion 2, and emulsion 2B, and all these things is simply because uh, they're very strong IP laws. You know? I can't reveal what the emulsions are. So, uh, we, have, we have applied for a patent, and it's, it's coming through sometime, and uh, we are looking forward to expanding this activity more. So you can see here, when we tried emulsion 1, it's highly toxic, less than uh, 100 milligram per liter. This gives you the hypophilic, lipophilic balance, which is very important for the emulsion. because We need to create the right emulsion uh, so that you can get the HLB value near to the HLB value of the oil that you're going to use and then create the emulsion. So, emulsifier, sorry. It's an emulsifier. So based on these results and based on our requirement, you see here, we choose a 15 and 11 emulsifier so that we could come to the emulsification uh, range, emuls HLB value close to that of coconut oil because one of our important thing was to use coconut oil as the base oil. So the coconut oil had an emulsifier toxicity level much greater than 2342 which is highly non-toxic. So there's no problem in using the coconut oil. So 
and then we tested some of the uh, this is the two emulsions which emulsifiers we choose and we choose some emulsifiers as essential oils as additives for this now why these essential oils were chosen was how did we go about choosing this we can't because i am not a plant uh, expert none of us were plant experts so what we did was we went and talked to some of the doctors who practice traditional medicine in india ayurveda it's called traditional they use plant extract to treat patients and we asked them and questioned them and found out what are the things they use for preserving medicines of course when they use these for preserving medicine obviously it has to be non toxic so we talked to them and we found out some of the things that they use for preserving things and then we tested some of them out some of the things which are used for killing insects also we tested them out so we found that some of them are relatively more toxic but when we make a coconut oil emulsion with the green additives we get a toxicity of 1064 mg per liter greater than that this remember this without the uh, without uh, with, with all these additives here in commercial cutting oil it was less than 100 mg per liter so when you say greater does that mean that you stop testing at that point and starting we don't need to do further than that it's rated as non toxic okay, so that's that's should get that upgrade in 1000 or whatever you can stop you can go further up but see for example coconut oil we tested uh, we went little higher so not required actually but that's the kind of rating of course there are new tests now the most stringent test is the fish embryo test so you must put this uh, fish embryo into this uh, test fluids and see whether the fish embryo will breed if it doesn't breed then it is that's a much more stringent test but uh, we we are not geared up to do that kind of work yet so this we can see that there's a huge difference between these things so the the key was first to clear this toxicity level test only once they clear the toxicity level test do we go for the testing there's no point in doing this without clearing the toxicity level test because the first primary thing is lost otherwise so having reached this level we went uh, to uh, what do you call determine the hlb values for various other things and then mixed up these essential oils to get other essential oils that we tried out yeah so we got hlb values for these things and then mixed them up com- combination with uh, of these will give you the hlb value of 12 which is what is roughly the hlb value of coconut oil so that you can use it and make an emulsion so this is the emulsions we came we studied the stability of the emulsion using a simple method standard method you can see that when you have an hlb value of 12 your emulsion is extremely stable otherwise your emulsion starts to separate out so we 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 uh, arrived at this concentration after finding hlb value and uh, these emulsions were stable for as long as 2 months and 3 months which uh, one of my colleagues told it's not just hlb there's something else happening there and i don't know what the something else is happening is it he was talking of thermodynamic stability of these things and uh, so i had to still go and talk to him and find out if something new can come out of it and the water is uh, pa water yes yeah pardon okay he, well, the, the question asked was uh, is what is the water that's used is di water it's a di water it's, it's very um, this is one thing in cutting oils you need to use di water you can't use water from the regular sources so emulsions of uh, what do you call uh, prepared with coconut oil with different kinds of concentrations of emulsifiers and we found that this to be the most stable one 25 emulsion 5b and emulsion 7a with 75% that emulsifier was found to be the most stable the rest of them were found to be quite unstable and uh, unstable again in the sense that if you mix it once it becomes an emulsion so in in a, in a in actual cutting oil situation in a cutting what do you call a situation you have the pump that's pumping this coolant all the time so it's it's kind of a regular missing mixing that take that you need not actually bother but you need to have a stable emulsion and then we tested out what is the emulsifier to coconut oil ratio that gives you stable thing so we found that 2% of emulsifier and 2 is to 2.5 ratio of emulsifier to oil ratio gives you a stable emulsifier if you don't use that what happens is emulsifier itself starts to separate out and they're not something that is desirable so we found this ratio to be the best thing and uh, once this was found out 
uh, we found out that this this particular emulsifier gave you the lowest particle size. That is, the we measured these uh, emulsion particle size using uh, light scattering and found that this gives you the lowest lowest size because the lower is the particle size, better is the cutting fuel. And of course, zeta potential is considered to be important. But this is something interesting we got here. The zeta potential for the uh, coconut oil emulsion was lower than I'm mean, actually higher than what is there for the zeta potential for the commercial oils, but still it was very stable. Now these are something that we need to work on scientifically to find out why this is stable with respect to the fact that the zeta potential difference is quite large. So they say the higher the uh, lower the zeta potential or higher the number, your uh, cutting oil is more stable. So we see that we are getting good particle size as good as the commercial one. We got lower particle sizes but we got very low zeta potential this, and this emulsion was not very stable. And then we do the next step of testing this thing out using uh, finding out the anti-corrosive properties. So one of the most important things in cutting fluids is anti-corrosive properties. Because you use them in materials in machines that have got large amount of cast iron and steels so you should not corrode them. So cast iron chip, this is standard pr procedure again, cast iron chips are placed in a petri dish containing a filter paper and diluted metal cutting fluid. The dish is covered and allowed, allowed to stand overnight. And the amount of rust stain on the filter paper is an indication of the corrosion control provided by the fluid. So when we check this out, the uh, anti-corrosion properties of this thing, so 5 is highly uh, non-corrosive, 4 is not uh, non-corrosive, not 5, 4 is non-corrosive and 1 is highly corrosive. You found that the reagent water is corrosive. But when you add these emulsion essential oils, you're getting as good as the commercial or cutting fluids. In fact, sometimes better, but these commercial, these coconut oil emulsion with these things are not as good in, st in stability as, as this one. So this particular one gave you extremely good stability and extremely good anti-corrosion property. And the other important thing is storage stability. So you need to measure the peroxide value of the emulsion before and after the test. It's one of the standard methods that is used. So lipid molecules upon storage in room temperature or higher temperature undergo auto oxidation. This is one of the biggest problems in vegetable oils. The vegetable oils are basically unsaturated. And that's one of the reasons why they are unstable. So they oxidize quite fast. But the beauty of coconut oil is that it is 92% saturated. And this is one of the reasons why coconut oil is condemned as an oil that can kill you faster. Because they say that coconut oil is... Uh, can give you heart attacks faster. And uh, there is one group lobby that says that is all this is not correct. There is one lobby that says which is correct, which is not correct, which is correct. I don't decide. It's basically uh, what do you call uh, the person who cooks who decides. So uh, when I when I cook, I use sometimes use coconut oil. When my wife cooks, she says don't use coconut oil. So it's a debate that's going on, whichever. But uh, I don't know whether what is correct and what is wrong here. But anyway. Coconut oil is highly saturated and its molecular weight of the uh, fatty acids are lower. It's of the 8 and 10 are the molecular weight of the fatty acids whereas in other saturated fatty acid containing things like uh, sunflower oil, soya oil, it's much higher molecular weight. Things. So this oil itself is naturally oxidation resistant. And one of the important things about these uh, these oils is that they are tribologically good themselves. All the oils, because vegetable oils with these fatty acids have more affinity to the uh, the material metals, and so they stick to the metals and they give you tribological protection much better than many of the mineral oils. But they are not used large extent because of the oxidation stabilities. But this problem is not there with coconut oil. So measuring the peroxide concentration directly provide information about storage stability. Cutting oil samples with natural oil additives showed lesser peroxide before and after over one test. And samples with additives can be stored for about three months without much variation in peroxide value. So you can see the peroxide value in first week to the fourth week. You can see that commercial cutting oil peroxide values are much lower. Not It's lower because they use highly, uh, what do you call, uh, to prevent these things, they use additives which are very strong. Whereas with the essential oil itself, ESNO5 and ESNO7, we are getting as good range of the peroxide values, which means they are very stable. You don't really have to bother about the stability. And question. Yes, please. If people can go back to the previous slide. What happens to the third week? Some of the numbers are 
This is something, yeah, except for this one particular case. All other things I think, except this one particular case is going down a little, but other cases all are going up. <coughs> so this is something that uh, we have to repeat the results, but we are not too worried about this thing because these... Uh, you know the commercial is going down. Yeah. Not, uh, it's kind of... Marginal error. Yeah, marginal error. I don't, I don't really bother much about this. So the kind of, you can say that this means that they are more or less stable, you know. They are not changing much with time. So uh, you have this results of over test after 82 hours for about uh, 84 degrees centigrade for about 48 hours. So what we do is we we keep these things, these emulsions in the uh, oven and see how much of them separate out after, at 84 degrees after uh, 24 hours. It gives you this more more uh, faster stability test. So you have the amount of emulsion, amount of oil that is separated out of this thing. So amount of emulsion, oil in a 6 ml is there for the this thing and commercial one is one. This, this seems to be much more stable than uh, these commercial, uh, what, what we have prepared. But again, I'm not too worried about this because very rarely in cutting operations you get the whole bulk of the coolant going to 84 degrees centigrade. Okay. But the emulsion stability itself at room temperature is extremely good. And then the other thing that we did, the most important thing is to find out the bacterial cycle properties of these cutting oils. For this, this is where the microbiology people came into being and uh, came into help to me. And uh, they did a lot of work on this. And uh, these are something that takes time. You simply cannot uh, do it fast. And I don't understand. They came up and told me all the bacterial names. I'll show you some of the names. I, I just cannot remember these names. It's very difficult to remember even your names and you ask me to remember these huge names. It's tough for me. And uh, so I call it bacteria 1, 2, 3. But I'll show you the names here. I'm not going to call it bacteria 1, 2, 3. So, but I won't be telling you those names because I find it very difficult to pronounce them. Anyway, this test done were very simple. Uh, in the sense, the procedure was, has to be carefully followed. So you prepare a bacterial culture, inoculate the bacterial culture into the sample, and the pouring media, you pour it into the media plate and dilute it many times and then count the colonies onto that. And the amount of colonies that grow in these, the density of the colonies is dictate how potent these, uh, or how good they are in controlling, control, controlling the bacteriological characteristics of the uh, cutting fluid. Now, this is something very important because many times cutting fluids are used for a month, two months in machines. Now bacteria should not grow in them. So we did tests. What we did was the zeroth day we measured the bacterial count, the thirtieth day, the forty-fifth day. This is for ah, this is one of those dinosaur names, you know, very tough to remember. But let's call this areas bacteria, which uh, which you can see that when we are using five and six is our seven and eight are the commercial ones. There are hardly any bacteria growth in five, six, seven, and eight. Okay, but you have an emulsifier with water. There is bacterial growth. Coconut oil emulsion itself is bacterial growth, and coconut oil is with 0.1 percent of ESNO5, that is essential oil five. It again shows you bacterial growth. But once you add essential oil seven your bacterial growth completely stops. Absolutely stable. In fact, at the end of the 45th day, in this particular, for this particular bacteria, there is some growth for the commercial ones, zero growth in our case. And this is for the E. coli bacteria, this is easier to pronounce. You see that E. coli bacteria growth is zero in our, with essential 0.5% essential oil, which remains zero even after the 45th day. There is some amount of E. coli growth here, that is it. And this is for the Salmonella, again very good antibacterial properties. Whereas the essential oils just, I mean the commercial oils just failed for controlling this bacteria. Remember we had tested only two commercial oils, I am dead sure there are commercial oils which will cut this also. So then we came to, after doing all these things, we came to the uh, cutting, I mean this was done simultaneously by many students. But uh, one of the tests that was done was see the performance of these cutting oils. Because finally, you might say I've got a cutting oil that is stable, that has got uh, antibacterial properties, that's got everything, but it doesn't cut. It weighs a tool bar, then it doesn't work. So when you talk of the test that we did, we did drilling experiments by keeping the workpiece submerged 
in submerged in this emulsion and then com compare the effect of cutting fluids on drilling using different uh, i mean using basically we did on aluminum to start with but we are going to start work on steel so use commercial aluminum and drill holes 100 holes into this aluminum okay this is kind of a standard test that is done in many papers that we write and uh, the surface roughness of each drilled hole was measured with optical profile so the surface roughness is one thing that tells you how good the cutting oil is the surface roughness is bad the cutting oil is not good so tool life was measured by measuring surface roughness of the tool for every 20 holes and chip size shape and length were measured and compared with other cutting fluids so this is the standard uh, condition that we use a spindle speed of 560 rpm cutting speed of 25 mm uh, meter per minute 21 meter per minute a feed rate of 0.037 mm per revolution and a feed rate of 20.72 mm per minute this is contain whole depth of 30 mm so these are the results the dry cutting obviously showed the highest roughness of the surface very high roughnesses the commercial cutting fluid showed as expected very low and very stable submersion and we used just coconut oil emulsion it showed good results but not as good as the commercial but much better than the thing but then we found that as the number of holes being drilled are increased the coconut oil emulsion itself is showing good but this do not have the other properties that is required so this is one of the things that was stable but this one which was the one we used essential oil fire and essential oil 7 showed as good as the commercial one so as a cutting property the concern is extremely good for this particular drilling operation i wouldn't want to extend this to all other drilling of other all other machining operation but for this particular operation yes it, it is good so i do believe that uh, we we have reached the stage where we can say that this cutting oil will work for at least these conditions so surface roughness is using 3d profile just some examples showing that uh, you're getting very good surface surface roughness with uh, what do you call commercial compared to commercial oil you're getting good surface roughnesses and uh, as good finish this is the direct result that i'm showing you So the tool to survey uh, where it is determined uh, by the difference in roughness of the tool in the 50th and the 100th hole, and the coconut oil with natural oil reduces the wear of the tool and increases the tool life too. And commercial cutting oils and coconut oil emulsion without additives showed increased tool roughness from 50th hole to the 100th hole. We we, are, we we do believe that we are having a better performance than the commercial cutting oils as far as this coconut oil is concerned. So the highlights is that we developed a product. water soluble cutting fluid which is readily biodegradable relatively non toxic when i say relatively non toxic is remember one of the essential oils did not have the toxicity as much as we wanted it about 1000 but was good enough for human consumption not a problem and highly renewable and sustainable product now we have used a commercial emulsifier a food grade emulsifier and i was telling my student this is possibly the weakest link in your product you need to come up with a direct emulsifier that comes from plants and see if you can produce them they are working on that and uh, coconut oil which is a completely renewable resource uh, for environment and uh, benign cutting fluid with 90 to 90% saturation and less oxidation is used as the base oil and natural oil varieties are used to enhance the cutting oil properties natural varieties are readily biodegradable relatively non toxic and highly renewable and developed a product that has better particle size aquatic toxicity anti corrosion resistance and as a comparable zeta potential and machining performance with commercially available mineral oil based cutting fluids something you developed now i wanted to show you a sample of this but uh, i was told not to bring the sample here not because of i'm worried that uh, you will find out what it is but simply because how do i explain to the if if i am asked in the customs what is this you are bringing i can't say i'm bringing cutting fluid cutting fluid is a poison so i can drink it no you don't drink it then it's a food product you're not supposed to get a food product into this country so then i decided okay let me not bring it let me not uh, get myself into the trouble so when i went to the customs they asked me have you got anything food item there was nothing no sweets no, no sweets so i didn't bring the cutting oil so then uh, so i had, i told them the truth and they didn't even scan my baggage they allowed me to go so that's the reason i bought but i can say you that i have drank this cutting oil absolutely no problem and my students have drank it but i found one very interesting thing no single visitor ever dared to taste this cutting oil because 
there is a there is a psychological barrier that cutting oils are poisonous and dead poisons and in fact one person came i drank it no no you i didn't see you drink it you are covering your hand like this you are trying to cheat me i had to drink one more sip of that and uh, my student you know i i asked him is it a good cutting oil he says yes it's a good cutting oil and uh, later on he comes and tell me sir that was something i didn't test myself you know you are the one who, you are the guinea pig there but it didn't there's no problem on that so instead of calling cutting oil we be calling it coconut juice coconut juice but <laughs> now these are some of the challenges that <laughs> we we are we are asking because coconut oil itself is dangerous you know considered dangerous i don't know where you you want to call coconut juice and people drink it and end up with heart attacks and you are sued for that you know so i didn't want to get into that trouble so but see the interesting thing is this is a completely biodegradable completely renewable we have closed the cycle where we are using product at the rate at which it can be produced you understand we are not using any non renewable resource as it's called and the second beauty of this thing is that we have developed this cutting oil which you can drink but i told my students also one thing for example let's say you have developed a cutting oil that you cannot drink can you think of using this cutting oil as a bio pesticide it's a possibility so we are working on those directions the other extreme is it's a poisonous thing which is not good for human consumption but can be used as a bio pesticide not as a cutting fluid okay i use it and then it degrades into benign compounds in no time after it does its job so here in india the manufacture of cutting oil amounted about 2000 kiloliters in 2001 we didn't have get the data for some reason for beyond 2001 and i'm sure this has exceeded now at least 3 uh, to 4 times this because there's a large economic growth in india in the last 10 years and uh, total consumption of metal working fluid in asia pacific region estimated to 8 Nine one three three zero tons. This is all given by these uh, web pages, which my student has gone through. And the United States alone, the market is one hundred and seventy-five million gallons. Huge cutting oil uh, thing over here. And the growth rate of metal cutting fluid is expected to be around five percent, with China showing the highest growth rate. And uh, so when I was talking of uh, the when you talk of the manufacturing, manufacturing has shifted to China, and it is slowly some of them are shifting to India. but the thing is that anywhere there's been manufacturing you have you have really trouble the environment there there's been a huge uh, econo- i mean environmental co- cost that is been with bone uh, that has to come up with this manufacturing united states had this problem 30 40 years back europe had this problem and now the basically the problem is shifted somewhere else you know you're shifting to somewhere else at some point you need to break the cycle <clears throat> and so the conclusion is essential for tribologists and lubricant engineers to develop a complete green cutting fluid to avoid environmental impact of the conventional mineral oil based cutting fluid and so we have developed a complete green product with coconut oil as base oil and green additives to enhance the cutting properties and biodegradable emulsion with green emul uh, showed comparable cutting and let's say i'm repeating this again just as a conclusion with conventional mineral oil based non biodegradable cutting fluids and further study on the mechanism Action of green additives may be, may be initiated. Uh, initiate the new era for uh, sorry. May initiate the new era for complete green cutting fluids. We do believe that we are we are just on the tip of the iceberg. There is large more development that can go on here. So, I just conclude my talk with showing some of some slides that uh, I show my students. I show whichever talk I give. So, eco friendly should be the purpose why we are living. to lead a comfortable life to be happy and successful so if you want happiness for an hour what do you do take a nap if you want happiness for a day go on a picnic if you want happiness for a week go on a vacation if you want happiness for a month get married and if you want happiness for a year inherit wealth but if you want happiness for a lifetime you learn to love what you do so i tell that if you love what you do all of you will be happy and this is what we are trying to inculcate in at least in the lab and wherever whoever i meet so they they are loving what they are doing and i can see them work late hours without even me telling them so uh, that's i think something that's good that's happening there so the message is 
Science without sustainability and sustainability without science are meaningless. And I do believe to close the cycle, these two things should be the cornerstones of development. And efficiency power is secondary. Now this is a question mark I have put there because all our development is geared towards making more efficient and more powerful systems. Faster, more efficient. <coughs> Should that be the cornerstone of development? If you, let's say you are doing a sustainable cycle, maybe you, you come down drastically on the power sector or the energy, energy levels that is there, but you will develop a sustainable system. And that's what we should be aiming for. So, the activities of the group, this is this part is one of the activities of the group, development of eco-friendly lubricant, greases and cutting oils. Of course, we work on surface roughness and friction because tribology has been my bread and butter. Fretting wear we are doing under control environments, sliding wear under control environments, aluminum foam work some we are doing, ultra fine grain materials by friction cell processing and welding and, and friction cell processing of ceramics. So, what is the Friction cell processing. It's a... It's a, it's a different process, a solid state processing of materials. So the way we make ultra fine grain materials. And uh, I got into this because that word F that is the got friction in that. And I'm a tribologist, so anything with friction excites me. And water purification, we are designing of packages and cartridges. I, I'm not into the activity of making the filters and cartridges. We design the cartridges for uh, packaging them for the... We are, there's a group that is working in IIT Madras. Indian Institute of Technology Madras, where they use nanoparticles to make filters. Exciting work they are doing. And development of tools for Indian farms. I am also a faculty in the Center for Product Design and Manufacturing. And uh, we made some of the other stuff for the thing. So I have this overview of my lab today. I have uh, completed six PhD students. I completed two masters. The ongoing PhD students are 12. Huge group now. So I don't meet them individually. I meet them in groups. It makes, makes uh, much better life easier for me and the discussions are much more meaningful. And uh, master's ongoing is one. I have some master's projects going on there, so put five. And a large number of undergraduate students come to my lab and work for brief periods, two months, three months, two months, three months, like that, over the year so that uh, they get exposed to the work we are doing. So I thank you for your attention. And this is our uh, central office that is built about a century, more than a century back. For those of you who have not come to Indian Institute of Science, you are welcome there. It's a wonderful place. It's a very green campus. Possibly the greenest campus in the country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, we can take some questions now, and I'm going to open that up also for our, our uh, audience that might be off-site. If they have any um, questions, they can type those in, and we will try to answer that. Too, but are there questions here uh, from the audience? How did you measure biodegradability? Uh, could you repeat the question? How did I measure? Like you said that these parts are biodegradable. How did I measure? No, we didn't measure biodegradability, but when you're using natural sources, they are assumed that they, they are biodegradable. Because when you show the bacteria growth data, yeah. you're also saying the bacteria are not trying Yes. So that thing is the See now, there are two issues here. One is, I told you, anything that's biodegradable. Yeah, biodegradability and eco things should not be confused. Okay, so when you're talking of biodegradability, these things, being plant sources, are essentially biodegradable. So, but they get biodegraded in a certain condition. So maybe in these cutting oil conditions, they're not biodegradable. But once I throw it into the soil, they'll degrade. Not an issue. But we are not measured that. It's an important question, but we are not measured that as such. Can you use the Zafra fish for your toxicity test? Yes. Do you try another, you know, one species for this kind of test? No, this is a standard fish they ask us to use. Okay, so this is actually... Zebra fish is a standard fish. Yes. Okay. And I know, you know, different chemical uh, contaminants uh, were different kind of uh, things for different species. Yes. Different uh, threshold levels of the okay, this But this is a standard that has been. But I told you they have come up with the most stringent standard in terms of uh, seeing whether fish embryo will grow in in these things. And that's a much more stringent 
environmental test, which we, we are not, we, we attempted it, but uh, not being an expert in this field, and I really could not develop the lab into that. Come back again? You know, uh, if you know some uh, bioluminant is very toxic, toxic, uh, very toxic, maybe you can turn to the biopesticide. Yes. So can I use a biolubricant which is toxic as a biopesticide? Yes, it can be. So this, I mean, the sun has toxic test is very important. Yes, toxic test is very important. Yeah, I'm thinking um, whether it's possible to recycle or use the uh, what's the common practice for shaper use the carnal oil today? Yes. And uh, the last, uh, uh, what's the, the degradation process for carnal oil? Regular cutting oil. So, yeah, I mean, I, I would, uh, can I go there and ask you? No. I don't be here. Okay. I can't <laughs> So, uh, your question, uh, can you repeat your question so that I can... Yeah, because, uh, the, the problem is, no, I had to repeat your question. So, if yeah. your question is long, I have trouble. First of all, to recycle, I use it, I can call you, what is the biggest challenge for um, recycling of the cutting oil? Yes. The, the, one of the challenges is recycling of the cutting oil. See, the, but the problem in countries like India and China, for example, or with any other uh, non-developed countries, is that cutting oils are dumped into the open. Now changing that is takes a lot of legislation and a lot of other act, associated things with the legislation. So that is going to be tough there. So better than the, so try to impose recycling conditions and after recycling what? After making it benign, which again is you're not, you're not sure what you'll do with it after that. So somewhere these toxins have to go and for Removing the toxins, you use energy, which is again non-renewable. Uh, so you are you are you are you are solving one problem and creating another problem. So we need to go into a a, 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 psych, a loop where we avoid all these things and close the loop. That was the philosophy. So to answer to your question, whether uh, recycling is there and as a possibility, I don't. We want to have a product that need not be. We don't even talk of uh, recycling. Simple as that. Uh, what is the cost of this? This cost when we worked out, so remember we are making in small batches. So the cost of small batches obviously be higher. It is comparable to the mineral oil cost. It's about 10 to 15 percent more than the mineral oil that's available in the market today. See in, in a country like India you can get mineral oils the rate, I mean the mineral emulsifier, mineral oil based emulsifier for something like uh, 85 rupees which is around less than 10, uh, less than 2 dollars a liter and uh, to something as high, uh, mineral oil based ones as high as 200, 250 rupees for a liter, that's about 5 dollars. To synthetic based which are not tested out, synthetic based something that we have to test out, synthetic based one which are very expensive, it's about uh, 80 dollars to 100 dollars a liter. So those we are not compared. We are compared with the commercial uh, available ones in India. So to that we are, we are coming to about five point five to six dollars a liter. And remember here we are using commercial emulsifiers. If I can come up with an alternative of plant-based emulsifier itself, I think I can cut out the cost quite. A bit. Yes, please. Is Armour uh, with automotive fluids yeah, like, like brake fluid. fluid yes we we did uh, the question is can can this uh, be used as uh, for other applicants like automotive transmission fluids and brake fluids and other things we we started some work on uh, using this as engine lubricants we did find success but the, why we didn't proceed with that was the elaborate testing that is required for uh, certifying an engine oil is something that we didn't want to, we didn't feel was is viable to set up in the Indian Institute of Science. So 
we we kind of stopped that work and then we took up work that is easier for the students to do in the Indian situation. That's the only reason. But we have developed, we had developed coconut oil based uh, uh, cutting fluids and other vegetable oil cutting fluids which are as good in the initial test. I wouldn't say it is as good in the final test but we have developed them also. And there are other groups also working on this, not my group alone. But cutting oil, this is only, only my group is working as far as I know in the country. Yes, uh, have we have we tried other vegetable oils? We have tried other vegetable oils, but other vegetable oils are not as good as coconut oil simply because of the amount of saturation. So the peroxide values will have problem. Oxidative problems will be there, and that could lead to other issues. But I think all of them are solvable. It's nothing that's unsolvable. You can you can put a process where you make them saturated and then use it as cutting. So one of your earlier charts, uh, you had um, surface roughness and the number of holes. You know. right. uh, for the dry the drilling, there was almost a periodicity. Dry drilling, yes. yes. That's maybe, uh, okay, the question asked was, uh, first time I'm repeating questions, you know, <laughs> sorry about it. Uh, the question asked was, there is a periodicity in the roughness when I'm doing it for dry drilling. Yes, it is there and this could be possibly because of built up edge on the cutting tool. So it builds up and after some time it goes away yes. and then uh, the time the roughness might go up and then once the build up or roughness might come down at the time. When the built up edge is not there it might cut very well and then the roughness might and when the built up edge is not there the roughness will be good. When the built up edge is there the roughness will be bad. So it could be the reason. We will not study that in detail. That's that is yeah it is there. Okay. The periodicity was less. Maybe that's that's an interesting. One more paper there. <laughs> Thank you for the idea. Okay. This was. Did I check the emulsion stability at lower temperatures? This was a question that was posed to me, because that's also the problem with using coconut oil. It's it's uh, pore point is 21 degrees centigrade. So that is the biggest problem when you, you develop it for engine lubricants. So you need to produce uh, reduce the pore point. But the, the answer to that question was, I don't see any machine shop running at sub-zero temperatures. No, I mean, if, if it has to be used in some other place. Pardon? If it has to be used in some other place where the temperature goes down. Yeah, but machine shops are not operating at those temperatures. Yeah, yeah shops, shops are always heated, you know. Yeah, but the dimension is being operated. Okay. That stability, yes, something I've to check out. But uh, I was saying the emulsion, you mean the emulsive, emulsive fire, not the emulsion. We are not, to be honest, we are not tested out, but my argument was that was there is no machine shop that operates and uh, no worker that operates a machine in sub-zero temperatures. So you always operate in heated shops. So. It was not, but nowadays they do use. They do use. It was not. And there are uh, many places that come up with the DNI water. Even for the water, I'm sure they start up with... They stock up, they stock up DNI water. We checked up with... DNI uh, water on all of them. I mean, there's a difference between DNI water and reverse water. No, no, not our water. It is DI water. Yeah. That's what they, they say. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I have not tested these waters out, but uh, yes, that's what because, they say. Uh, our experience, and we have done a lot of And I've been to several plants across automotive companies, across people like Caterpillar, Beers, and so forth. It is very unusual <laughs> to see people take care of the water quality in this country. And how it might be very different in India, I do not know. But the biggest problem with emotion stability is not because that you cannot take the emotions, but because of the water. calcium and dilatant ions improves the makeup. So I was surprised to hear that. Uh, That's what I mean. We have, we have we have asked them to use DI water, and we use DI water. But uh, like you say, it, it may not as well as we as as much uh, using DI water. They might use RO water, which is passed off as DI water. We have to see how how stable those emulsions are. Thank you very much for speaking today.